Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kendall, and uh, I am a member here of Sager Family Farm. And ours is a small backyard farm. So it's actually only 600 square feet. So it's a pretty tiny backyard. Um, but in our front yard and backyard, we've got tons of beautiful pollinator plants, which we're going to talk about today. Um, before I get started with anything, there are, it looks like there's a lot of us here and there's still a few of us trickling in right now. So I just wanted to go over the interface for anyone who is new. So I cannot see or hear anybody and your microphone and your video camera will never be on during this session. So nobody else can see or hear you. So you guys can see and hear me, but I cannot see or hear you. Um, it also looks like we're in an office and I think many of you were promised that, oh, we're getting a garden tour. I have lots of pictures and videos just so that I can show you lots of things really quickly. So don't worry, you're gonna see lots of cool stuff, lots of live insects and even critters. Um, so other things are, you can ask me questions over here in this box. Uh, I don't always get to questions right away just because it's hard to show you pictures, videos, and talk all at the same time. Um, so I try to get to them at the very end. So type them in there and only I can see your questions. So no one else can see what you're typing, just me. So feel free to type in any question you can think of and it's totally anonymous and I will read out the question and the answer uh, later on. So if I miss a question here or there and I'm not getting to it at the end, type it in again just so that I see it because I see lots of questions. Sometimes I'll have questions for you, um, which you can either type in over here if I'm asking you to type it in, or sometimes they're multiple choice, in which case they'll pop up down here and I'll point them out when it's time for you guys to answer some questions. Um, so let's see, I think unless there's any questions right away, just in case a few of you missed the beginning, uh, I am Kendall Sager of Sager Family Farm, and I have an itty bitty suburban farm out in Alameda, California. So that's an island in the San Francisco Bay. Um, so our farm is very tiny. It's suburban. So that means that uh, we're actually in my house right now, and my farm is my backyard, which is 600 square feet. So that's a pretty small yard. That's about 20 by 30 feet. Um, but I do have honeybees. I have chickens. I even have miniature sheep, um, along with all of my veggies and uh, pollinator plants. So I've got lots of things going on in our tiny, tiny garden. So um, we are definitely going to be talking about a lot of different kinds of bees today, because I know I promised I would be talking about bees. So bees are pollinators and I'm talking about lots of different bees. So I have lots of cool bees to show you today. So um, let's get started because I'm actually gonna play a game with you guys in my garden today. And I have a handout that you can print out and play at home, but we're gonna be playing pollinator bingo. So I'm gonna show you my bingo board and I will give you guys a tour of my garden and we're gonna be looking for all these sorts of pollinator things. So we're gonna be looking for pollinators themselves. So we're gonna be looking for some bees, butterflies, birds, um, but then we're also gonna be looking for the things that attract them. So there's def definitely lots of different foods that might attract them to my garden. And there's a lot of shelter that might attract them to my garden. So I'm gonna show you guys a lot of videos of my garden just so that we can see everything. So we'll start out in my front yard which my front yard, when I first moved into this house, looked like this, which looks really pretty to me as a human. But to a pollinator, there wasn't a lot to eat here. The grass doesn't offer anything to eat. And there were a few flowers blooming. There's a hydrangea plant in there that's not blooming in this picture. But uh, those flowers, bees don't really like them very much. Butterflies don't really like them. so. These plants weren't up my alley because I really like to attract pollinators. So even just earlier this year, we finally got around to making our front yard into a pollinator garden. So it looks a little less tidy than it did before, but this is a huge attractor for pollinators. So let me show you guys a video um, of all of the things that are blooming in my front yard. So here's a quick tour 
of the front yard. So what we did is we took out a lot of the lawn, the other plants, all of the mulch, and we threw wildflower seeds into our front yard. So taking a little bit of a closer look at some of these flowers, um, let's see, this one is one of my favorites. This is lamb's ear. It has very soft little leaves. Oh, and there's even a uh, bee flying through the shot. I've got some little miniature snapdragons. And then lots and lots of wildflowers in bloom right now. We've got the orange California poppies. Um, so a California native that grows really well here and bees really like. We've got these little yellow flowers with white tips. We have just plain yellow flowers. Those are dandelions. We have some bright blue flowers that are California bluebells. And then over here, we've got some more snapdragons, more tidy tips, um, which are the yellow flowers with white tips. So these are all blooming in my yard right now. And you can even see insects buzzing through. So this is actually, my garden is quite small, but it's providing a lot of things for pollinators. I've got some lavender there that's not quite blooming yet. And then we just saw the very tip of those little white flowers were alyssum. So let me show you guys a little bit closer what all of those flowers looked like. Um, so here, and I'm covering up the California poppy with where I am, but you should be able to see all of the other flowers. These are flowers that are currently in bloom right now in my front yard. Um, so I did have different flowers blooming a little bit earlier in the year and later in the year, I'm gonna have different flowers blooming because I'm trying to provide something to attract my pollinators all year round. So let's take a look then at my bingo board. So let's see, we identified a lot of flowers that are blooming in my garden. So let's take a look and let me make myself a little smaller so that we can see um, all of the flowers. So I left an empty space for me in this one. So here we've got our bingo board and here is where you can type in uh, some answers. So is there anything I can check off already on my pollinator bingo board that might be helping my pollinators? So type in over here if there's any squares that you think I could check off right now. Um, so even just looking at the, fr uh, the first row here, um, I'm looking for mostly like I've got honeybees, bumblebees, but edible plants. So does anyone think, are any of these plants edible? In which case, type in the edible plant over here. Um, are any of these, let's see, on the next row, I see some, oh, there's a native plant square. So if you know any native plants, so plants that grow here in California, you can type them in over here. And uh, then let's see, is there anything else? Oh, there are actually some pictures that I didn't point out in my video, but there might be a fruit or a blooming tree. So if there's any of these that you think are a fruit or a blooming tree, let me know. So let's see if anybody's typing in some things. Oh, so it looks like a few folks are saying like, okay, there's some native plants in here. Um, so, oh, there's some lupin. So lupin is a native plant here. A lot of you oh, are saying California poppy uh, can be checked off because that is a native plant. So let me get my marker out here and let's see if I can X this off. Let me do, I'll do some pink so we can see it. Um, so we'll mark off our native plant because our California poppy over here is a native plant. Lupin is a native plant. The California bluebell is a native plant. These gold fields are native plants. Um, I'm pretty sure clovers are native and the tidy tips grow here really well. And dandelions, I'm pretty sure, um, and wood sorrel. Actually, I've got a lot of natives going on here. So we definitely have some native plants. Oh, it looks like a lot of you are saying, I have also got an apple. So my apple up here in the corner. So that is a fruit. And that one actually also checks off my blooming tree. So both my apple and my orange are blooming trees. So let's see. Oh, and the apple is an edible plant. So the apple, the orange, those are both edible. Not the flowers themselves, but it's going to make a fruit that is edible. I'll show you guys some backyard pictures, and I have actual more parts of the plant that are edible in the back. So you guys are so great. You guys are typing in
quite a lot. Oh, and a lot of you said free space. So I can check off my free space because I automatically get that. Um, so that's pretty good. So we've already X'd off quite a few things. And um, if we're going to start looking for pollinators, the reason I've said these are pollinator plants and they're included on my pollinator bingo board. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys a multiple choice question now. So let me get that up here. So it just popped up down in the bottom corner. So what type of food are bees collecting from the environment? So why do I want to have all these plants here? Are they collecting honey? Are they collecting pollen and nectar? Or are they collecting leaves? So what type of food are the bees collecting from their environment? So this is a food that they're collecting. And it looks like a lot of us are saying pollen and nectar. So I haven't seen anyone type in honey yet. Um, no one's typed in leaves. Everybody's typing in pollen and nectar. So we definitely have a lot of pollen and nectar uh, going on here. So this is why I planted a lot of these plants is to start attracting pollinators. Because if I threw a party and had a lot of great food there that you liked, so if I had maybe some pizza, some cheeseburgers, some chicken nuggets, some ice cream, that sounds like a party that I'd like to come to because it has lots of great food. So I put a lot of great food for pollinators in my front yard to attract them. Oh, and I almost forgot there's two sneaky things in my bingo board that I think are still there. And these are parts of flowers. So I don't know, can anyone name uh, two of the flowers? So I see two different flowers that I can actually see the anther. So the anther is the part of the flower that has pollen on it. So it usually sticks up. So that is this square right here. So the anther is this part, this kind of little part that sticks up. And then the other flower part is the stigma. So the stigma, the sticky stigma collects the pollen and that's how this plant gets pollinated and makes its seeds and makes its fruits. So can anyone list over here on the side, uh, what flowers can we actually see those on? So let me, oh, so someone's saying the California bluebell. Exactly, that's the one that the anthers really popped out to me. So the anthers, I can see these little white tips of the anthers and they're actually, they're connected into the center of the flower. So those are the anthers. So we saw the anther as well. And then let's see, can anyone see a stigma? Oh, someone just typed in the orange. So the orange was the other one I was thinking of that it was really easy to see the stigma. It's this one right in the center. You can see the anthers surround it on the sides and are much smaller, but it's got that little yellow stigma sticking up right in the center. Um, so good spotting. So let's see, and I think you could probably see them in a lot more like the tidy tips. You can see they're very tiny in there because there's actually a lot of little mini flowers going on in there. Um, and then the California poppy, you can see the anthers look a little bit different. They're kind of these weird little just kind of like floofs. So they don't look as much like an anther as like the California bluebell looks really textbook with those balls holding the pollen at the top. So let's go and try to look for, now we've seen a lot of food that's gonna bring my pollinators to my garden. So let's examine my garden a little bit more for some pollinators. I'm gonna clear all of this off and I'm gonna show you guys a video of a pollinator that I saw just the other day. So this is actually, I think another one that I didn't point out, but this is actually a lemon tree. Um, so I do have a lemon tree and here I see a little honeybee and she's got her face inside of the flower. And let me ask you guys, Another multiple choice question. Um, so over here on this or down in the bottom corner, what is this bee doing? So let me play that video one more time while we answer that question. So what is this bee doing? Is she smelling the flower just because she kind of likes it? Like I, these sm flowers smell really great, very sweet. So I can smell these easily when I walk down my path. Is this bee? collecting nectar or is she collecting pollen? 
So she is probably smelling the flower a little bit in the course of this, but she's doing one main task. And let me play this again one more time so that I can point out how I know what she's doing. So pollen is really dusty. So usually the bee is rolling around when she's collecting pollen. This bee has her face very still in the center and you can see her abdomen is pulsing just a little bit. So her tummy is pulsing like she's trying to suck something out of the center. So here you can see she actually she's sticking her face straight in there and then she flies away. If I could see a little more closely, um, I could actually see that she is uh, collecting nectar. So great job for everybody who said she's collecting nectar. Um, so it's definitely tricky to see if she's collecting pollen, but let's see if we can find another pollinator. So I was looking again around the garden and when I was looking in the middle of all those wild flowers, I saw this great big black and yellow fuzzy bee here that is very quick moving. So it was hard to keep the camera on her. So let's try to take a look at her again. And she was, oh, it ended a little quickly at the end there, but she was like, rolling in that flower. So let me play that one one more time. And I'll ask you guys a question at the same time. What is this bee doing? So she's rolling around in the flower. She's not staying very still. So at the end, she kind of rolls around in the flower and then leaves. So like she's trying to get all this dust on her. So what do we think this bee is doing? Because she's rolling around, she's definitely not staying still. So we can see that one more time. So this is a bumblebee and she's actually a yellow faced bumblebee. And that it's a pretty good name because she has a bright yellow face. So and she is pretty quick. And I think a lot of you guys are saying this bee is collecting pollen and that's correct because and the reason the main reason even though this was really speedy that I know that this bee was collecting pollen was because California poppies do not produce nectar they only produce pollen so that is the other reason why I need so many different types of flowers in my garden is because some flowers produce nectar, some flowers produce pollen, and some produce both. So I want a variety of foods to keep my bees nice and healthy, and I need flowers that produce both nectar and pollen. So my little honeybee was collecting nectar from the lemon, and that bumblebee we saw was collecting pollen from the California poppy. So I kept watching my front yard um, and I saw some very quick little bees that didn't quite look like either of those bees. So let me show you guys a video here. And again, this bee is so quick and very hard to see, but she seems to really like my snapdragons. So she keeps going into my snapdragons. She's very fast and she's just quickly collecting nectar from each of those flowers. And maybe she looks a little bit like a honeybee, but maybe not. She looks a little bit different. So let me try to get, I found her when she was sitting still. So here she is taking a rest on my lamb's ear. Um, and I was able to get pretty close. Usually they fly away when I try to get closer to them. Um, so this little bee is taking a rest. I can see it looks really different than the bumblebee and the honeybee. Um, so this is actually a native bee. Uh, so that one is a Pacific wool carter bee. And she's probably taking a rest on that lamb's ear because they collect the fuzz off of the lamb's ear to make their nests. So they actually make little cocoons for their babies out of the fuzzy parts of lamb's ear and other woolly things. So they could also use something like cotton um, and that's what they're collecting to make cocoons for their babies. So that was actually a native bee, a native solitary bee. So let's see, I saw a bunch of others. And these ones, these are short little videos because these bees are so fast. But I saw these tiny little bugs zipping around. So here you can see just the tiniest black bug on my alyssum before it flies away. Let me try to play that one one more time because it happens so quickly. But 
there's this little tiny bug whoop, and then it flies away. So let's take a look at another one that I found sitting on a dandelion. Because these ones, they definitely, they're small. They don't look like any of the normal bees that I would usually see. And let's see if I can do that one one more time because it was such a quick video. Again, so here's this little bee-like thing kind of sticking around in the dandelion before it flies away. And then the last one, we can definitely tell like from how big my bumblebee was on the poppy. This is a tiny little bee. It looks almost like an ant. Um, and let me play that one. Oops, that's my bumblebee video that I just queued up. Hold on, let me get that bee back one more time. So these little bees, I think most of these are sweat bees. So that is a different type of bee. There are actually 1,600 different species of bee in California alone. So if you're sitting around a bunch of flowers, try to take a close look at all the different things. If it is really a honeybee, a bumblebee, or even just some sort of bee you don't recognize. I actually have this bee book and it has pictures of hundreds of different kinds of bees and actually probably thousands. Um, but this one is specific to California, so to where I live. Um, so this is helping me identify the bees, but so many of the bees look so similar and move so quickly. It's kind of hard, but those little bees are native bees. So let me take a look again at our bingo board. So let's go back to bingo and oh, I've got another picture. Actually, before I go back to bingo, let me show you one more video. Then let's see, let's look at this video. So this video here, we just looked at a whole bunch of tiny little sweat bees. So itty bitty little bees. And I found this thing and it was very tiny, like the sweat bees, but it was a really different shape than the other bees. And it's kind of like flat and it's got like big eyes. So it was definitely kind of a weird looking insect. And so that's the picture I have to show you guys. So let's take a look at the picture of this bug here. So I'm gonna ask you guys a multiple choice question now. So it's down here. So it's a yes or no question. Is this a bee? What is this thing? So it's yellow and black like a bee. It has three segments to its body like a bee. So if I take a look at, um, it has a head, it has a thorax, and it has an abdomen. So it has the same body parts of a bee, but it's not looking exactly like a bee to me. And I think the things that are looking a little bit different, let's take a look at it next to a honeybee, for example. So. The things I'm noticing that are different is that it has this weird flat abdomen. So it's kind of flat. Um, the other thing that I'm noticing is basically its entire face is eyes. So a bigger proportion of its head are eyes. And then let's see, let me clear this off so that we can see the honeybee has these kind of long curved antennas but then this thing has these like short little stubby antenna. So this thing is looking a little bit different than a bee. And this insect is actually a hoverfly. So some people call it a bee mimic because it does look a lot like a bee. We find it on flowers, it's a pollinator, but it's actually a fly. And the thing that I think is the biggest giveaway that I actually saw on that little insect when we were watching it on the flower, when I zoomed in right at the end, is that I could see that it had those little stubby antenna. So that gave it away as a fly instead of a bee was the antenna. The eyes are another big giveaway. Those big eyes usually give it away as a fly, but the antenna are the thing that I think are easiest to see is that they have these short stubby little antennae. So, Let's see, so I'm gonna go and now look at our bingo board. 
because now I think we've got some more to cross off. And let me make myself a little smaller again so we could see all of the things we saw. We saw the yellow-faced bumblebee. Um, I put a leaf-cutting bee originally on that little fuzzy bee, but I think I was just looking just before we started in this book, and I saw a picture of the bee that I thought that little fuzzy bee is. So she's not a leaf cutter bee. She is a Pacific wool carter bee. Um, so again, they're really hard to identify, but I saw more of the coloring on the bee's back that gave her away. We had our little tiny sweat bee and we had our honey bee. So I'm gonna look over here on the side. Are there any more boxes on my bingo board that I can check off from the insects that we saw in my front yard? So let's see anything else that we can see. So we definitely saw a lot of different types of bees. So does anybody see any squares we can check off? Um, so a few people are saying fly because we saw that hover fly so we can x off our fly let's see a few guys are saying bumblebees so we can cross off our bumblebee and then let's see oh a few people are saying honeybee so we've definitely got our honeybee and so is there anything that kind of encompasses our wool carter bee or our sweat bee so oh, honeybees are social insects, which means they live in big hives. Um, bumblebees are also social. They live in nests with a few hundred bees. The leaf cutter bee, or this one, the wool carter bee, and the sweat bee, and it looks like a few of you are uh, listing it over on the side, are solitary bees. So these ones are solitary bees. Oh, someone even caught that we saw a native bee nesting material. Um, so that uh, lamb's ear is the nesting material for the wool carter bee. Um, I think I saw a few of you say that we saw a bee, let me see what it was, oh, but a bee collecting pollen. So when we saw the bumblebee, she was rolling around in the flower, so she was collecting pollen. So that's our square down here at the bottom. And what about anything else? Let's see, bee drinking water. Oh, someone said we saw bee drinking water and I don't think we saw that one just yet. We did see a bee drinking something though. Um, so the bee was drinking something sweet from the flowers and I think I've got a square for that right here. I saw a pollinator collecting nectar. So it was my bee who was collecting nectar right there. So I think, those are all the ones we got for now. So let's see if we can see anything else. Let's see, oh, and someone saw wind. So I did see those flowers were moving around a lot. So we did also see wind. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna clear these ones off and let's go to, I think, our next video. So let me show you guys uh, what my backyard looks like a little bit. So we focus mostly on the front yard garden. So let's take a look at the back. So what's going on back there? In my backyard, I mostly leave for like my veggie garden and other things like that, but it still has some pollinator stuff in it. So I'm gonna take a quick walkthrough of my backyard. The first thing you probably notice is there's a whole bunch of chickens running around. So there's definitely not too much for pollinators here because the chickens have dug up um, everything into dirt. Um, but over here I have a water fountain. Um, so that might be something good for my pollinators. In here I've got some sheep who were munching on their breakfast when I took this video. And I have hanging plants to keep them out of reach of the sheep who really like to eat all of the things near them. Um, so here I've got a little basil, which is an edible plant that I like to eat. Here I have some chives that when they bloom, this is also a pollinator plant, but something that's edible for me. Down here, this is kind of in the sheep's grazing zone. So I have a sad looking little lavender plant, um, but the lavender uh, is something that the pollinators like a lot. So that definitely attracts the bees. And then if I look up on this side, I have a bunch of honeybee hives. So here are my honeybees coming back with all of the things they're foraging. So they're foraging for nectar, for pollen, and then they're bringing it back to their beehive. 
So over here, I've got my veggie beds. So this is usually where I put edible plants for me. I've got a nasturtium over here, which I have seen honeybees collecting pollen from. This is also an edible plant. I can actually eat the flowers. Here, it looks like dirt, but if you look really closely, I see some tiny little carrot seedlings. These ones are radish seedlings. Over here, I've got some mint that I really like to make into tea. Here, I've got some sweet peas, uh, which bumblebees will visit. They smell really, really nice. Uh, and I have my sweet peas growing on a trellis, so that way I can use even more of my space so my plants can grow up and over so that I still have walkways through my garden. And over here I have some kale. Um, so this is something I usually make salads out of, but you can see it's still a pollinator plant because it's actually starting to bloom. So it has these little yellow flowers that are popping out over here. And then uh, over here I have some more potted plants. This really tall one it's not blooming yet right at the tip though is a bachelor button um, which is a great pollinator plant and these ones are bigger versions of snapdragons which i had little ones these plants are plants that are going to be planted somewhere in my yard i've also got some tomatoes uh, which the bumblebees will like a little bit later and i have seedlings of more plants that i'm going to plant i've got some strawberries going here are my sunflower uh, pumpkin and cucumber seedlings and then I've got more strawberries because I like strawberries a lot. I'll probably be planting those pumpkin and cucumber seeds, actually those little seedlings, around the trellis so that they can grow up over the trellis as well. So the pumpkins can actually grow on the trellis so their vines will grow up and over and the pumpkins will actually hang down. These are little pumpkins, they're sugar pie pumpkins. So they're meant for making pies out of, so they can hang pretty well and not fall off of the vine. Um, so I'm trying to utilize our small space as much as I possibly can. So let's see, and someone noticed out there that even though flies are pollinators, I have a fly trap, and that is actually because of my chickens. So my chickens, when they poop in my yard, they attract a lot of flies. So I have an abundance of flies in my yard. Um, so I try to have some fly traps there just so that the flies aren't everywhere and become a nuisance because I do live in a close neighborhood and I don't want flies all over my neighbor's yard bothering them when they're eating outside. Additionally, too many flies can be bad for the health of my chickens um, because there are some diseases that my chickens could get um, where they kind of get kind of a messy butt and the flies will lay eggs on the chicken's butt and it can hurt the chicken. So that's why I try to keep the population of the flies a little bit lower just so it's not out of control because they have a lot of food. And these are also different sorts of flies that are usually going after rotting material as opposed to pollinating like that little hover fly that we saw. So I do have a fly trap. And it doesn't attract the other critters in my yard. So it doesn't attract the bees because it has a scent of rot. It has a really bad smell to it so that it attracts the flies and a bee wouldn't be interested in that. So let's see. Are there any plants that ladybugs like? We're hoping to get um, lure some ladybugs to our garden. So ladybugs actually like to eat aphids. So if you have aphids or other pests in your garden, they'll actually come, the ladybugs will stick around in your garden. So you can often buy ladybugs from garden stores. You can get them in a little Tupperware container. And the pro tip that I've heard that really works is release your ladybugs in the evening so that they uh, spend the night in your garden. And that tends to make them stick around a little bit more. Um, but there are plants actually that attract a lot of aphids. And the one that I see the most is milkweed, which I'll talk about actually in a little bit. Milkweed gets lots of aphids and can attract ladybugs quite a bit. So let's see. Let's take a look at, um, let's go back to my pollinator bingo over here and see what we've got. So here in the front corner, so right at the beginning of our backyard tour, we saw a water fountain. So this is a water source over here. So we can X off our water source uh, square over here. 
And that's the reason why we need a water source is our pollinators actually need to drink water. So um, butterflies will drink water off of sponges and things like that. This fountain splashes quite a bit and makes the rocks really wet. So bees like to drink water off of rocks. Right now, I haven't seen any pollinators drinking water. And that's just because there's a lot of moisture. There's a lot of dew on the plants in the morning. So the reason why if you come out and the grass is wet, you get all wet in the mornings, that dew um, is something that the bees and other pollinators can drink. And they'll bring it back to their nesting site. So the bees will bring it back to their hive and they'll use it to maintain the consistency of honey. And they'll also use it for hot days. So this is the most times when I see bees drinking water is when it is really hot. When it is like over 100 degrees and I would like to be eating a popsicle or be swimming in a pool, that is when the bees are collecting water because they're using it for air conditioning inside of their beehive. They actually put little droplets of water throughout their beehive and fan their wings to cool the hive down. So water is a necessary thing for my pollinators. So I do have a water source here. So let's take a look um, at the backyard again. Does anybody see anything else that was on my pollinator bingo list? So anything else, and let's see, and we'll have to remember a little bit of what is there. Oh, and it looks like a few of you did because I was talking about it quite a bit, the honeybee hives. So I've got some honeybee hives right over here. So my pink, orange, and yellow honeybee hives. These are huge honeybee hives. So here I can X off my honeybee hive. The yellow and pink hives probably have in the order of 30,000 honeybees in them each. The orange hive is a little bit smaller, so it's probably a little behind at 20,000 bees. At the height of summer, these boxes will be about as tall as I am. I'm about five feet tall. And these hives could hold up to 60,000 bees in them. So honeybees have really, really large hives where they all live together. Um, so that is quite a bit. And let's see, I think I saw another question in here. Is do butterflies pollinate the same things as bees do? And sometimes yes, sometimes no, because different flowers are different shapes and different sizes. So a hummingbird would go for a different plant than say a honeybee would because a hummingbird has a long beak with her tongue that she can stick and then get lots of nectar, whereas a honeybee has a short little tongue. So uh, butterflies tend to have longer tongues and can drink from different flowers. So they can drink from some of the same plants that bees are getting nectar from because they can just put the tip of their tongue in. So I do see them sharing some of the same flowers, but they tend to go for different flowers. So you do, that's why I have so many different flowers is to attract a variety of pollinators because they're all looking for something a little bit different. Um, so the snapdragons, I mostly see bumblebees um, on the big snapdragons. And then those little snapdragons in the front, I only see those wool carter bees going for. Um, then if I'm looking at uh, some sage plants, which I'll show you in a minute, I only see carpenter bees, those big black bees, and hummingbirds drink from those. So that's why I have so many plants is to get this huge variety of pollinators. So great job seeing the honeybee hive. So let's take a look a little bit more. I know there's some more questions, but I'll get to them in a minute. Um, so let's take a look, I think at, um, oh, actually, let me show you some more videos. I've got more videos of cool stuff because we were just talking about butterflies. So let me show you guys some butterflies. So over here, I've got a close-up of my kale, and then there's this white butterfly fluttering around, and it has some black markings on its wing. And this little butterfly is actually a cabbage white. Um, they call it a cabbage white because it is attracted to members of the brassica family. So that's what cabbage is. It's also what kale and broccoli are. So they are very attracted to these kind of leafy green things, and they will lay eggs 
on the underside of these le uh, leaves and their caterpillars will eat the kale plants. So usually I will pick a lot of these caterpillars off and feed them to my chickens because I want to eat my kale. But inevitably, a lot of them do make it to be butterflies. So I do like my butterfly pollinators, but I also like my kale quite a bit. Um, so I do give some of the caterpillars to my chickens. But one caterpillar that I have been trying to attract for years, and I have only seen since I moved to this neighborhood in Alameda. Actually, I did see them in my old neighborhood, but I never got them to lay eggs or stick around is the monarch butterfly. So I do have this tropical milkweed. I have another native milkweed that's not blooming yet, but this butterfly was drinking some nectar from the tropical milkweed, but this is also the butterfly's host plant. So that is the plant that she's gonna lay eggs on. So she's gonna get up in just a second and fly around and she goes around some of the leaves. So she actually ended up laying an egg on my milkweed. So this is the first time ever, this happened just like less than a week ago, um, that this butterfly, so right there, she was laying an egg. So I actually collected this egg and I'm gonna grow it in my butterfly enclosure. So this is a monarch butterfly hanging out in my front yard. There she was laying another egg. So let's take a look. Let's see, I think now I showed you guys, we've got some butterflies, so let's go to the next one. So here we saw a cabbage white and a monarch. Um, the other two things that I saw in my yard that I didn't really point out as we were touring is I've got some more host plants. So I have fennel, which looks a lot like dill. If you roll it in your fingers, it smells like licorice. And that is a favorite plant for the swallowtail. So swallowtails are another big butterfly about the size of a monarch, and they're yellow and black. They're very beautiful. And then the other thing that it's very small, so I don't expect it to attract any butterflies for a few years, is a passion fruit vine. So this is a vine. It makes passion fruits. So they're little purple fruits. And on the inside, they've got these orange juicy seeds um and it makes delicious juice especially if you mix it with orange juice passion orange juice is some of my favorites um so that grows really well here in california but it's also the host plant for the gulf frillary which sometimes you can mistake it for a monarch but i don't think so when you really look at this butterfly because it doesn't have very much black on it it's an orange butterfly and it's smaller than the monarch um, but these are more common butterflies that I still see in my area because we have a lot of their host plants. So now I think uh, some of you guys guessed it. Over here, you can type in some of the uh, squares that I can X off now. And let's see, I think a few of you are asking if we can see the egg and I do have a picture of the egg and I'll pop that up next because it's pretty cool. Um, and then let's see, oh, it looks like um, some of you have collected the swallowtail caterpillars and are raising them. So I actually have in my kitchen right now, I have five swallowtail caterpillars and I have two monarch eggs. And next Tuesday, I'm actually going to start a weekly project where we monitor all of those caterpillars. So if you like caterpillars, you can come watch me on Tuesdays starting next week. And we'll be taking a look at all of those caterpillars. And hopefully some of them will make it into a chrysalis before the end of the school year. So it looks like a lot of you are saying I can cross off the butterfly and I forgot to mark off this one. So I'll mark that one off later because I'll show you guys some more nesting materials. And then it looks like we saw a lot of butterfly host plants. And then I also forgot to mark this one off again. So we can definitely mark those two. But we got butterflies and we have their host plants. So the reason why host plants are important because my butterflies do need nectar in order to survive. So nectar is one of the things that's gonna bring them to my garden, but the host plant is where they have their babies. So they are very interested in the host plants. And a lot of the host plants also produce nectar. So uh, my bees will usually like the milkweed in the fall. The native milkweed blooms later in the year. And it's actually important to have lots of different flowers that bloom throughout the year so that I have food all year round for my pollinators. 
So that's why I do have some plants that I didn't feature because they're not blooming yet. Um, but the tropical milkweed blooms much earlier, which is why I put some in my garden. Even though it's not a native plant, it's still a host plant for the monarch butterfly. It's more common in places like Mexico, which is one of the places that monarch butterflies um, will go down to. So they will usually it's more the eastern monarch that goes down to Mexico in the fall and all the way up to Canada in the winter. But the monarchs we see around here often stick around this area. So Berkeley has a lot of overwintering sites. So does a lot of the East Bay. So there are actually spots you can go to see the monarchs hanging out in the winter. Um, but that's why the monarch also likes tropical milkweed is because it is within the range of some of the monarchs that go down to Mexico. So let's see. Um, and someone's asking me, what is a butterfly shelter? Which I'll show a little bit more, but this butterfly shelter, um, it's actually a box and it has some slits in it. And this is something that can help protect butterflies at night because they don't really have a house to go back to at nighttime. So this butterfly shelter, if you didn't have a butterfly shelter, they would try to find um, some leaves to protect them or kind of slats in bark. So the butterfly shelter, uh, imitates that. So you usually put a bunch of twigs in there and then it's got these thin slats so that they can kind of crawl in there at night, keep nice and warm and out of the wind and then crawl out during the daytime. Let's see. Oh, and someone's asking me if I can find a bat. So the bat I put on my list as an aspirational find. So I have seen bats around the Bay Area, um, usually in more forested areas, but you can attract them. So I'll show you guys a bat shelter later on, which hopefully I'll put at my farm soon enough. So let's take a look. Oh, let me show you that butterfly egg before we go any further. So here is the monarch butterfly egg. It's really hard to see because it's so small, but it's right here, that little white kind of oval looking thing that's just stuck on the bottom of the leaf. The butterflies usually like to take their abdomen and curl it around underneath the leaf to lay the eggs on the bottom because it helps protect them from predators. So it keeps them out of the sun where something might see them and then eat them before um, the egg gets a chance to hatch. That's also why that even though the butterfly laid its egg outside, I collected the leaf that the egg was on and brought it inside into my habitat. Um, so that way I can control the predators. So I'm trying to shelter this egg and make sure it makes it to an adult butterfly. Um, so I don't want an aphid to come along and eat the egg uh, while I'm waiting for it or anything to eat the caterpillars. Though monarch caterpillars aren't the tastiest, they're actually poisonous. So there are not many animals that can digest them. And that's why they're such bright colors. So let's take a look then at, um, oh, I've got another video over here and let me clear my drawings over here. So over on my side yard, this is actually where my driveway is, but on the side of the driveway, I have a lot of sage. And like I mentioned before, I see a lot of big black carpenter bees that drink from the sage. I have this yellow plant that I actually don't know what it is, but it seems to attract um, hummingbirds and carpenter bees. And here I, I apologize for the poor quality of the video. The hummingbirds are just so fast. See if you can see this hummingbird on this pink flower. So she's kind of flitting around right now. Oh, and then she flew away. Let me show you guys. I have a video just of the end right there where we started seeing the hummingbird. So over here, let's see if I can draw a circle around her before it gets started. So right now, she oh she's too fast for me to draw a circle around it. Oh, let me play that one more time because I feel like I got cut a tiny bit short. So let's see if now it's buffered properly. But if you can see that little hummingbird, she's just popping around to the pink flowers. Again, I apologize. I've been trying to get a better video of a hummingbird, but it is so hard because she's so fast and she doesn't like it when I get too near to her. But over here, now I can X off my pollinating bird because I found a pollinator. So this hummingbird is one of the pollinating birds. She's drinking nectar and she might get some pollen on her as she goes from plant to plant. So let's see, I think our next one that a lot of you said, oh, we've already seen that is 
a native bee nesting material. And I actually just saw this one hour before we started this. So I actually didn't know that this plant was a native bee nesting material. So the lamb's ear is a native bee nesting material because of that wool carter bee. So she's collecting the fuzz off of the lamb's ear. This is a nesting material for a leaf cutter bee. And you can see down at the bottom, you can see all of these leaves down here have these little circular cutouts, like right on the sides. And they seem like such perfect little cuts. This is a sign of a leaf cutter bee. And I did see her just before we started class. So I didn't get a chance to take a picture of her, but this was for sure a leaf cutter bee. I actually don't even know what this plant is. It was kind of a weed that just started growing in my front yard and we left it because I thought it might bloom. It never bloomed, but now that I know it's a nesting material, I'm gonna leave it. Um, so let me show you how a leaf cutter bee would actually use this nesting material. So I actually have a video and this one was created um, by an organization called like Deep Look and they make excellent videos about some really cool topics. But this one is about leaf cutter bees. So let me show you that. Okay, this bee seems confused. That leaf she's gnawing on is no flower. But this is an alfalfa leaf cutting bee. She needs hunks of leaves to build her nest. A lot of them. All this is her lacy handiwork. She hauls the pieces back home. Leaf cutters use them to line the inside of their nest. In nature, she might use a nook and cranny in a log. But here, her nest is in what's basically a bee apartment building. A high-rise made of styrofoam. These markings help the bee find her way back to her personal condo. You know, like 7B. So that's how the leaf cutter bees use the leaves. It's, they cut it and use it for their nesting material. Um, so if we take a look back at our bingo board, we definitely have um, nesting material. And I think we've got wind. So here is another picture of different nesting materials. So it doesn't just have to be leaves uh, that are nesting materials. This bee in the center, let me see if I can draw on this one more time. So the bee in the center is using resin as little walls in between her larvae. So to wall off the different cocoons. Um, and resin could be collected from things like tree sap. So some bees collect tree sap. This one on the bottom is using mud. Um, so this is for a mason bee. So the mason bees have their little cocoons um, right there. But the mason bee that is the mother mason bee, she walls off each cocoon with mud. So there are lots of different nesting materials. So I did have mud available, but it's getting a little hotter here in California. So mason bees are usually found in the early spring when it's the wettest and mud is available to them. So there's lots of different nesting materials. So over here, I think we've got nesting materials, we've got wind. I think I have lots of bingos now. So I've got some bingos over here, a bingo here, another bingo this way. Um, I definitely, I was so close to having, oh, and I've even got a bingo down at the bottom. I'm so close to having blackout, um, but I still have a few things to add to my pollinator garden to make it really perfect to see all of um, the pollinators. So let me go back to um, full screen so I can show you. Here's ugh, one thing that I want to put up in my yard. So just like those leaf cutter bees had that apartment building made from styrofoam, this is a native bee hotel. So bees can go into these little tubes and they can nest. So a honeybee or a bumblebee wouldn't go in here. They build their own nests. 
but a leaf cutter bee, a wool carter bee, a mason bee, all of those solitary bees look for little cavities. Some of them do nest in the ground, so they might dig a burrow, but a lot of them nest in these little tubes. So if I had a native bee habitat, that would attract even more solitary bees to my yard because now they have a place to have their babies. So I need to hang this up somewhere. I've just been looking for the exact perfect spot. And also, I wanted to make sure I had food for them first. So food was the first step. And then I'm going to add some shelter for them. So let me show you a few more of the things um, that I don't have yet, but I would like to have soon. Um, so these are a few examples of um, the butterfly houses uh, that we could have. So let me get my drawing. So this is an example of a butterfly shelter. Um, so there's the slats in there that the butterflies can go inside. And usually you would put like twigs and sticks in there, maybe some bark. And that is a nice shelter for the butterflies at night. This one here is a bird house. So the birds, in addition to pollinating, they can help spread seeds. So even if I've got um, a bird house for a type of bird that might eat seeds, they can help spread the seeds and help plants grow. And then over here, um, these ones are bat houses. So underneath, the bats would come in underneath, right at the bottom, like so down here. And this is a view from underneath. And these are bats hanging underneath there. So you can actually attract bats. So I'm going to see if I can find a place to put a bat uh, shelter and see if I can attract some bats. So we'll see. I'm not sure if we're too far into the city and that bats might not like it here, but bats often eat insects at night, but some of them also are uh, fruit eating. So they'll go and they'll eat nectar and they'll get pollen all over their face as they move from plant to plant. Um, so some of them can be uh, great pollinators. Some of them just eat mosquitoes and things uh, that might bother us. So that's why I wanna have some bats around anyway. So let's clear that off. And I think I've got, um, that was pretty much our pollinator bingo. So let me see over here if you guys have some questions. Oh, it looks like some of you have a bat box. Do you have any bats in it? That would be super cool. Cause I was thinking that about the butterfly shelters and the bat boxes. I have seen a lot of bat boxes in use. I haven't seen many butterflies in the butterfly shelters. So I wanna know if those actually work, but. It's something I want to put in my yard to experiment with myself. Let's see. And I've got some questions. Is raising swallowtails inside saving them from predators or is it better to leave them in nature? Um, so as long as you take care of your caterpillars well, I think that it does help save them from predators to raise them inside. Um, so I like to raise them inside. I don't take every single caterpillar out of the wild. Um, just because I do want to leave some to naturally procreate. So the only reason I take them out um, of my yard is for educational purposes. So I just take a few. Um, for monarchs in particular, there are a lot of people who will take them out of the wild to raise them. So there are specific clubs. And the thing with raising the butterflies inside is monarchs are facing a lot of issues. So their nesting habitats down in Mexico are being destroyed. Um, a lot of times, I think they had a few years ago, they had a lot of trouble with tropical storms, um, wiping out a lot of the monarchs. Additionally, there are some diseases and bacteria that are affecting the monarch caterpillars and killing them before they can reach adulthood. So that's why people are really focusing on the monarch butterflies to try to save them and planting more milkweed for them. So the things that I do when I'm raising especially monarch caterpillars um, that are very sensitive to that bacteria is in between when I'm raising different generations, I sanitize everything with bleach. Um, and that's because I don't want to infect future generations of caterpillar. So that's one way that I'm taking some precautions and saving them on the inside. Um, the other things that I do, I always make sure my tropical milkweed that isn't from here and can grow kind of all year round, I actually chop it down to the ground in the winter time so that it gets fresh new leaves. So none of this bacteria is hanging around on my tropical milkweed. 
Um, but you can raise these caterpillars inside. It's really educational. And as long as you're taking care of them well, so that means getting them fresh leaves all the time, uh, then it is actually helping them. But I don't take all of them out of the wild because that's where they do ultimately belong. So mostly I take them out for educational purposes only and I share them with my classes. Let's see, so why do hummingbirds collect nectar? Um, so hummingbirds collect nectar, that's one of their food sources. So it gives them lots of energy because you've seen how fast that hummingbird was and it flaps its wings really fast. So it needs to consume lots of sugars. And nectar has lots of sugars that that hummingbird is turning into energy for its body. So that's why if we put um, like hummingbird juice out in a hummingbird feeder, it's actually really, really sugary to help keep that hummingbird running at full speed because they're very, very hyper. So let's see. Oh, a few of you have some bats living in the eaves of your house. Um, and let's see, I don't know the exact requirements for having a bat box. Um, so that's something I'd have to look more into. So my bat box is a little further out, but my native bee hotel, I will have that up shortly. So I'll have to look into the bats uh, a little bit more. It looks like a few of you are going to be making some bird houses. Um, oh, one question is, do all bees live in hives? So not all bees live in hives. So I mentioned the solitary bees. There are actually, I'd say about 70 to 80% of all bees in the world are solitary. So I would say most bees don't live in hives. Most bees that we might see might live in hives though, because honeybees, there are a lot of them around. Honeybees live in big hives. Um, and then bumblebees are the other social bee that I usually call it a nest. Um, because they usually take over old bird nests. So they'll move in and create their nest inside. Um, so those are two bees that live in colonies. So collections that you might call a hive. But solitary bees usually live in reeds, straws, like those little tubes, old insect holes. Some of them burrow into the ground. Um, so some of them burrow into wood as well. So the carpenter bee burrows into wood. So most bees actually don't live in hives. Let's see. Um, and a few of you. So I gave you the main garden tour of my whole farm and things like that. So right now I'm mostly into the question answering part. Um, so if you need to take off, that's totally fine because I'm just going to stick around and answer questions. But I do have one bonus video because most people like seeing the critters at my farm. So we took a big tour of the gardens and everything that was great for pollinators. But let me show you guys a bonus video of my sheep. So this is a video I took this morning of my sheep eating breakfast. And uh, the reason why I wanted to add this in here is because my sheep are eating alfalfa. So my sheep are actually benefiting from pollinators. So that little alfalfa leaf cutter bee that was pollinating the alfalfa is helping create alfalfa that feed my sheep. So all of these pollinators end up creating a lot of food for humans and for animals. Um, so this is producing a lot of our world's food supply. Um, about one out of every three bites of food is produced by honeybees. So they're pollinating it so that we can eat it. Um, or by bees in general. So pollinators are definitely really important to creating food for us, and even my adorable sheep. Um, so everybody likes seeing those little sheep. So let me see if there are any questions. Um, let's see, so some of you may have missed the beginning. I'm Kendall Sager of Sager Family Farm. I am a local beekeeper and farmer that I farm in my backyard. So I have a suburban farm down here in Alameda, California. But mostly what I do for the rest of the year is I actually bring my animals into school. So I do school visits with my honeybees. I bring them in in a glass case so that we can see them inside their hive. I usually bring my chickens in, but unfortunately, since the whole Bay Area is, uh, is on shelter in place orders, I am doing digital tours, which actually opens us up to seeing a lot more stuff around my farm. So you guys saw a lot of really cool uh, things that I don't usually get to bring to school. Let's see, and someone's asking me, how did I get my sheep? So I got my sheep 
Uh, from Southern California, I found someone who bred this special variety of sheep. So my sheep are actually the size of a large dog, like a golden retriever. Um, so I found someone who bred this kind of sheep. They're called baby doll sheep. Um, so I drove down there. I put the sheep in my car and drove them back here. Um, so that's how I ended up getting my sheep is I got them as little baby lambs. So they were quite tiny and adorable. But now they're full size and they weigh about 50 pounds and are the size of a golden retriever. Let's see. Um, do caterpillars like California bay leaves? I don't know the answer to that question. I've never seen a caterpillar on a California bay, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist because there are so many different types of insects. Um, so usually I'll have to go to the internet to find that one. Let's see. Um, someone's asking, oh, do I live in a desert? So I wouldn't consider where I live a desert. A lot of California I do consider to be quite dry and deserty, but I actually live on an island. Um, so it's an island in the San Francisco Bay. It is quite wet here. Um, so I was actually not used to living here. I lived about 50 miles away before where it was a lot hotter and drier. Um, so I lived in the Los Altos area, so that's the South Bay. Now I live in the East Bay, but also I live kind of in the Bay. Um, there is so much water here that I often do not have to water many of my plants. I do uh, water my raised veggie beds. But most of the rest of the plants in my yard, I do not water most of the year. Um, so it's definitely pretty wet here compared to the rest of the Bay Area. I think the North Bay, you guys are a little more wet up there as well, but uh, it's pretty wet here in Alameda especially because we're so close to water. Uh, the bay is actually about a block and a half that away from me. So I'm very close to a lot of water. So let's see. Um, do, do, do. There's lots more questions. Um, so it looks like some people have found some bees. Oh, someone's asking me, do I have a bee suit? I do have a bee suit. So I wear my bee suit when I'm opening my hives. When I gave you guys that tour of my backyard and we got really close to the beehives, I was actually just like this. So the bees typically don't want to hurt me at all. Um, so sometimes bees boop, bonk into me on accident. But as long as I'm calm and I don't whoo, start swatting at them, they stay very calm too. So I don't always need to wear my suit. The one thing that I do typically do if I know I'm gonna be working very close to my bees without my bee suit is I will put my hair back because my hair is a little bit like a spider web and the bees might get trapped in it. And if the bees get trapped in a spider web, they get a little upset and they think a spider might be coming to eat them. So if I'm trying to get them out of my hair, she might accidentally sting me because she's scared. So I wear my bee suit when I'm opening my beehive because there's a lot of bees in there and it helps keep me calm around my bees. The calmer I am, the calmer the bees are. And that's not because they can smell fear on me. It's because I act differently when I'm scared. So if there are bees around my face or getting stuck in my hair, I might start freaking out a little bit and I might be scared and I might start waving and squishing bees. And I just opened up their house with all of their babies inside. Um, so that's why uh, when I open my beehive, I always wear my bee suit so that I can stay really calm, move very slowly so that the bees don't think I'm attacking them. Um, so that's why I always wear my bee suit. I actually have a whole nother lesson about bees called Big Buzz About Bees. And it shows you pictures and actually videos of me in the bee suit opening the beehive, using all of my tools. It's pretty cool. So if you want to know more about the honeybees, you can check out my Big Buzz About Bees lesson. Let's see. Um, let's see. And it sounds like a few of you have um, some bumblebees in your backyard and maybe a predator. There are lots of predators, which is why I try to make such a nice oasis with lots of shelter for my bees um, so that it can be a nice, safe place. And I think 
I've gotten to all of my pollinator questions. Thank you guys so much for sticking around for such a long time. You guys had some great questions. So I hope you liked playing pollinator bingo. If you want to play at home, I have a worksheet on my website, um, which a lot of you are here um, with your teachers. So your teacher will probably share that with you. So if you want to play at home, you can play pollinator bingo and see how many boxes you can check off. Because it sounds like a lot of you could check off bats when I can't. Um, so thank you guys so much for coming. Bye.